Now, we're gonna, I'm going to read a revelation. I'm going to read a short sermon text passage because um, the sermon might be long. So I'm just going to read one verse to get us kicked off. Roman, or revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, so much for allowing us to gather here this morning. God, we pray now that as we open up your word, that you would open up our hearts to receive from you, uh, Lord, uh, just instruction and, and, and correction. And Lord, help us to be to grow in righteousness as a result of your word uh, this morning. God, I pray that you just help us to be spirit filled listeners. God, help me to be a spirit filled speaker. And God, may you get all the honor and glory and praise Do your name this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Most of us are probably familiar with the Ten Commandments. Uh, we know that when, when, when God chose Israel as his people, he promised to be with them and to bless them, but they were to maintain their covenant with God by keeping the law. Um, and, and through this covenant, God intended to make himself known to the nations as the one true God. Now, who remembers what is commandment number one? Yeah, don't worship any gods. That's right. Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me. So it's clear from the beginning of the law that God demands exclusive worship. Then commandment number two goes along right with it. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And so we notice something here. The first two commandments have to do with our worship. They're given the highest priority because they deal with our ultimate loyalty and devotion. And so, so right here in the first beginning of his law, he's saying, worship me and me alone. And I want to remind us this morning that God's priority for his people has not changed. And he is still a jealous God who demands our worship because he alone is worthy. In our text this morning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be directly challenged to break these commandments. Their commitment to worship the one true God will be put to the ultimate test. And we'll see that their response serves as a powerful testimony of what it looks like to serve God alone. And the outcome will reveal the significance of our own commitment to worship the Lord. We're in week number three in our series in Daniel. And so far we've seen Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, they're young captives that have been taken from Judah to the pagan land of Babylon. And throughout this process, they have remained faithful despite difficult circumstances. Through the first two chapters, we witnessed that God used their situation to declare his glory in the most powerful kingdom on the earth at the time. And we've seen that no matter what happens here on earth, God is on the throne and his sovereignty is in control of all things. In today's passage, the sovereignty of God will once again be on display as these young men face a choice. Will they bow down to the idol or will they stand firm in their faith and devotion to God? We mentioned a few weeks ago that, but it's worth repeating here, that worship is more than just the songs that we sing on Sunday morning. Worship is a life dedicated to following God. It's, it's committing ourselves to fully to his way. It's a lifestyle of submission, obedience, and surrender. As Paul puts it in Romans chapter 12, it's being a living sacrifice, ready to lay everything down at the feet of Jesus for his glory. As we walk through this story, we need to ask ourselves, do our lives show that God alone is worthy of our worship? Or have we set up other idols in our hearts, bowing down to things of this world and letting those things take priority over God? Let's get into the text. First, I want to point out the temptation of idolatry. The exact timing of this story isn't, is, uh, isn't clear. Daniel doesn't tell us, but it, it likely takes place sometime near the events of chapter two. If you remember, or if you weren't here last week, Nebuchadnezzar had a troubling dream about a large statue made of different metals. It had a head of gold, 
uh, arms and chest of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and feet mixed with iron and clay. And these represented the major kingdoms that would, that would rule throughout, uh, throughout history. This statue was destroyed in the dream by a giant rock not cut by uh, human hands. And that represented the kingdom of God that would eventually overthrow all earthly kingdoms. And when Daniel interpreted the dream, he revealed to Nebuchadnezzar that he was the, the head of gold. Him and the Babylonian empire were that head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar at that time praised Daniel and praised the God of Daniel uh, as the God of gods and the Lord of kings for revealing the dream's in interpretation. But in chapter 3, we see the first thing that he did after that is he created an image. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So, so Nebuchadnezzar created this enormous golden image. Apparently, hearing that he was the head of gold went to his head. This, it wasn't just a statue, though. This was actually a statement. By making the entire statue of gold, Nebuchadnezzar was essentially rejecting the message of the dream. Instead of acknowledging that his kingdom would one day fall and he, he, he was declaring, hey, my kingdom is the kingdom that's going to stand. My kingdom's the one that's going to last forever. The golden image was set up in defiance of the God of Israel. Statues like this were common in ancient times. Leaders often had giant statues erected in honor of themselves or in honor of their gods. And we're not exactly sure what this statue looked like. It could have been an image of Nebuchadnezzar or a representation of their Babylonian god Murdoch. But what we know that it was an impressive statue. It was about 90 feet tall. That's like the size of an eight or nine story building. It was nine feet wide. It was, uh, it was probably uh, made of bronze and it was completely plated with gold. It was set up in the plain of Dura, just outside of Babylon. And, and archaeologists believe they have found a, a, a place where, the, uh, just 16 miles outside of the city of Babylon, where they believe that this statue stood. And what you'll see throughout this passage as we read through the text is that one phrase is that is repeated over and over again is the phrase set up. Nebuchadnezzar set up this image. And the language, again, it stands in direct contrast to what Daniel said in chapter 2 about God setting up and removing kings. See, see and Nebuchadnezzar wanted to play God. He, he was essentially saying, hey, I'm the sovereign king. I'm the one in control. And this idol was his way of setting himself up against the God of heaven. And you know, idolatry might seem like it's a, an outdated sin that we don't really struggle with today. But let's pause for a moment and honestly consider, are there idols in our lives that we have set up against God? I would argue that in 21st century America, we face idolatry in a greater magnitude than ever before. We might not have a 90-foot statue like Nebuchadnezzar, but in the same way we reject God's commands, we dismiss his revelation, and we set up our own image of what we think life should look like. Let's take an, an obvious, easy example, marriage. God's design is clear. One man and one woman in a lifelong covenant relationship. Yet our culture has rejected this and set up its own image. And we see man with man. We see women with women. We see one man with two women. And we see, uh, used to be a man that's now married to a woman. And there's all these perversions of God's way that we see in our world. Our, our world has taken the blueprint and replaced it with his own image. That's idolatry. But before we get too comfortable pointing our fingers at our culture, let's acknowledge that we as Bible-believing Christians are not immune to idolatry either. The God of this world has set up many idols for us to worship. Sexuality, power, health, wealth, acceptance, entertainment, fame, comfort, and the list can go on. These are good things that can become God things when we elevate them when we set them up above God's place in our hearts. When we devote ourselves to these things and allow them to dictate the direction of our lives, we are no different than the pagans who bow down to the graven image. So let me ask you, are, are there idols being set up in your life? What have you allowed to take God's rightful place on the throne of your heart? 
Now let's keep reading. After he created the image, Nebuchadnezzar made a call to worship. He's, verse 2 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then all those people again. I'm not going to read them all again. Uh, all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So, so once the image is completed, Nebuchadnezzar summons all those in authority positions to come together for a dedication ceremony. This would have been a very diverse group representing all the lands that Babylon had conquered. It says that there are people from different nations and languages there. Nebuchadnezzar had a tendency to appoint uh, natives to rule in their land. Again, as long as they cooperated with all his demands, there was no problems. Nebuchadnezzar was going to present these rulers with a test in their loyalty to the king and to the Babylonian ways. That official herald came out and he said that whenever the music started playing, they were all to fall down and worship this image of gold that he had created. And I just want to highlight here, side note, um, that music has been a part of worship for centuries and it can have a powerful influence. Um, so, so, when we think about that, we need to understand that our music matters. Now, I'm not going to tell you that if you listen to Taylor Swift or Leonard Skinner or Drake this week that you are indirectly worshiping Satan, although you might have been. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be the Holy Spirit and tell you what you should and should not listen to. But I think we have to be careful about what our music is encouraging us to worship. Is it encouraging to worship those things that have been set up by the world, like immorality, materialism, pride, and all kinds of debauchery? Or is it pointing us toward a creator in the beauty of all that he has created? You got to be careful with our music. I know that wasn't popular. When the music played, they were to bow down and worship the golden image. If they didn't, they were going to be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. This furnace was likely a kiln that was used to, to make the golden image that was repurposed as the, an execution chamber. Nebuchadnezzar was willing to, to keep the peace as long as everybody fell in line, but any defiance was met with a, a brutal iron fist. Well, these officials weren't trying to get burnt up, so we see in verse 7, the crowd bowed down. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of, the, of all the music, they fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So when they played, the music played, the overwhelming majority of the crowd decided to go ahead and bow down and worship. Some of them have probably had fully embraced the Babylonian ways and they were aligning themselves with Babylonian culture and values. Some of them probably bowed down out of fear, not wanting to face the consequences of standing out. And many simply just went along with the cloud, just trying to blend in and be unnoticed. But the fact that it remains that nearly everybody bowed down and worshiped the image. And that's a hard truth for us today that worshiping God alone will not be the popular path. The pull of the crowd is strong and most people will get swept away by whatever is trending. They, they just agree with whatever they hear on their, their favorite news outlet or, or what the culture is loudly affirming. But if God is truly your priority, you'll often find yourself standing against the tide and against the majority. And that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They chose not to conform. Even when everyone else bowed down, and this brings us to our second point, the accusation of the worldly. Let's pick up in verse 8 where the Chaldeans made their charge. It says, therefore, at that, certain, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. 
you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So in a crowd the size of all those that were gathered, it's unlikely that the king himself noticed that three men still were standing tall while everybody else was bowing down. But there were some Chaldeans who did notice, and they were eager to report what happened. Daniel describes their action as a, a malicious accusation. The, literally, the literal translation of that means they ate their lunch. It's, it's pictured as like a, a lion tearing apart its prey. It wasn't just a simple report. It was a vicious attack, likely driven by jealousy and hate, hatred. Remember, the Chaldeans were the Babylonian wise men. In chapter 2, they were the ones who failed to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, while Daniel, uh, with God's help, was able to interpret it. So Daniel and his friends were promoted to high positions, even above these Chaldeans. So you can imagine the resentment that was in them. They were envious of these foreigners who had come and taken their place. There might have been some, uh, uh, an undertone of anti-Semitism here too. Is notice how they emphasize to the king that, hey, these are Jews. Highlighting their, hey, these are foreign people. And they have different religious practices. And they couldn't stand the way these young men lived differently and worship differently and remain loyal to their God rather than conforming to the Babylonian culture. So realize that if you make a stand for God, it could put you in a situation where you come under attack. Jesus himself said in John 15, if, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So these young Hebrew boys came under, under a vicious attack. Now look at the king's challenge in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the, uh, before the king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tiger, and harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So to say that Nebuchadnezzar was angry was an understatement. The text says that he was in a furious rage. He, he immediately summons for the three young men to come stand before him. But even in his anger, he questions the accusations. Perhaps he, he doesn't trust the Chaldean's report or, or maybe he can't believe it. anyone would dare def defy him. But when the young men come in, they confirm their stance and Nebuchadnezzar offers them one last chance. He says, I'll have the music play again. If you just bow down, all's forgiven, we'll forget this ever happened. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then comes the question that really cuts to the heart of the story. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? See, this was a direct challenge to the God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar had already witnessed God's power to reveal dreams in chapter 2, but now in his arrogance, he believed that not even this God, the God of Israel, can save these young men from his wrath. The commitment to worshiping this God was going to cost them their lives, and no God was worth that. He sees himself as the supreme power above their God. Now, I know that we want to quickly identify with the Hebrew boys here, saying, hey, yeah, we're willing to stand firm against idolatry, but let's examine our own hearts again. How often are we more like Nebuchadnezzar in this story? How often do we exalt ourselves above God? How often do we convince ourselves that we are in control, that everything depends on our strength, our own power, our own decisions? Yeah, we may not say it out loud, but we live as if nothing or no one can stop us. Nebuchadnezzar's pride led him to challenge the God of heaven. And if we're honest, 
Isn't that what we do when we trust in our own abilities? When we refuse to bow to God's will and choose our own way instead? Well, after this accusation by the world, we see the position of the godly Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have taken the easy path, the path of least resistance. They could have just went along with the crowd. They could have bowed down. They could have justified it in their minds saying, hey, we'll bow down with our bodies, but we're not going to bow down with our hearts. But these young men wanted no part of compromise. They had a deep conviction that there was only one true God and they refused to bow to anyone else or anything else. And again, following Jesus is rarely the easiest path. Sometimes it feels like we're swimming upstream. Sometimes it's, it's the road less travels. But here's the question that these three young men had to face and that we need to ask ourselves, is God alone worthy of our worship no matter the cost? Even with their lives on the line, these three refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's image. Look again at verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So notice their boldness as they affirm their stance. They didn't waste time defending themselves or trying to argue their case. They said, hey, we don't even need to, to give you an answer about this. Their decision was already made up. There was no discussion. They were not going to bow down. They stated that their faith, they stated their faith in God's ability. They knew that God had the power to rescue them from the furnace. There was no doubt about his ability, but at the same time, they acknowledged his sovereignty. They, they understood that God doesn't always choose to work in miraculous ways. They said, but if not, in other words, even if God chose to not rescue them, they were still going to remain faithful. This wasn't a lack of faith. It was an expression of true unwavering faith. They trusted that God could save them, but they also trusted him if he chose not to. Whether they lived or died, they, they had already decided they would only worship the one true God. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow, Nebuchadnezzar was again beyond furious. We see his whole demeanor change toward them. He was no longer willing to give them another chance. Look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed with, against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics and their hats and their other garments and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was so urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took, the Shadrach, took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. So Nebuchadnezzar's rage led him to order the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. And that was an idiom meaning, hey, max it out. Make it as hot as it can possibly get. The king called for his strongest soldiers, tie up these three men, throw them into the flames. And he was so agents, uh, so urgent, so hasty, the furnace was so intense that the soldiers who threw them in even got killed by the heat. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make sure that these young men suffered. So he threw them in fully clothed, hoping that their clothes were going to catch on fire and they would be quickly engulfed in the flames. Nebuchadnezzar sat back, ready to watch them burn. But something unexpected caught his attention. In verses 24, we see the demonstration of victory. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was honest, astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And their appearance and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So the king was stunned. He leapt to his feet he, in disbelief. He, he turned to his officials to confirm, hey, we threw three people in there, right? Because there's four people in there. 
And they're walking around. The flames are not touching them. And, and the fourth one doesn't look like a normal person. He said he looks like a son of the gods. From Nebuchadnezzar's limited perspective, he could only recognize the figure as something that was supernatural. Scholars debate whether, you know, was this an angel or was this what we would call a Christophany, an, an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? I would lean towards that way. But either way, what, what is clear is that God's presence was with them in the fire. And, and what an unbelievable demonstration of victory. What an amazing display of God's presence with his people. Obviously, this was a miracle that they were able to walk out of those flames. But I think the principle remains that God walks with those that walk with him. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he got the W in this one. He brought out his fiercest weapons against them. But Nebuchadnezzar learned that day that no weapon formed against God's people will prosper. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or, or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hey, and I'm, I'm here to encourage us this morning that even if you're walking through the fire and the flames, even as you navigate the storms and the rain, God's presence is with his people. And whether it's by life or by death, he will bring deliverance. So live for God. He's worthy no matter the cost. There is no lose in following Jesus if we adopt Paul's mindset from Philippians 1.21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Seeing that his plan completely backfired, Nebuchadnezzar called out to the young man. Let's read what happens in the next verses where we see the exaltation of the worthy. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not, had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. So the king approached the furnace, he calls the boys out, and he was now convinced that their God was the most high God. Of course, still, he, he held this polytheistic perspective. He wasn't a, a yet ready to acknowledge God as the one and only true God, but he recognized that this God was greater than all the other gods. When the young man stepped out of the furnace, everyone gathered to inspect them. Not a single hair of their head was singed. Their clothes were untouched. And they didn't even smell like smoke. Nebuchadnezzar was amazed, not just at the miracle, but at the unwavering faith of these boys. He was impressed that they would rather face death than compromise their loyalty to God. Nebuchadnezzar witnessed the presence of God, the protection of God, and the power of God in this miracle. And through the bold stand of these boys, Nebuchadnezzar learned that their God was truly worthy of praise. Let's see how this ends. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the kings of a man and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. 
for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So in response to this miraculous deliverance, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, uh, the, uh, were, were promoted in the kingdom. And the king issued a decree that no one was able to speak against the God of Israel or they would be put to death. And again, this is an extraordinary proclamation coming from a foreign king who was steeped in idolatrous worship. It's clear that his words were motivated probably by a mix of fear and a mix of awe. Nebuchadnezzar had just witnessed firsthand the power of God, a God that he defied. And he realized that this God was unlike any other. And so probably out of fear, he's saying, hey, don't say anything against this God because he was worried for his own life and what this God might do to him. As we see, the boys were promoted again. Their, their faithfulness in the faith of death not only led to God's blessing, but again, it elevated their influence, giving them a greater platform to display God's glory in this wicked land. So we see once again that God sovereignty, sovereignly orchestrated this event for his glory. Nebuchadnezzar challenged the God of Israel saying, hey, who is the God that's going to deliver you out of my hand. And he learned that day that it was the most high God. Through the boy's commitment to worship God alone, Nebuchadnezzar and the world saw that the Lord God of Israel was worthy of worship and praise. God does, God does a great miracle here, but we have to be careful not to let the miracle overshadow the message. Throughout this chapter, we see the repeated themes of, of bowing down, serving, and worshiping. And Daniel's major point throughout the, the chapter is clear, is that we must worship God and God alone. God created all people to worship. We are designed to give our adoration and allegiance to him. But because of the brokenness of this world due to sin, people have turned to worship other things. And there's a, uh, there's a constant push from our culture to worship anything except for God. That's why our worship is part of God's mission. It, it's not just for us. It's a testimony to the world. When we as followers of Christ serve the Lord whole, wholeheartedly, when we are committed to his ways, when we stand firm on his word, our lives boldly declare to everyone around us that our God is worthy of following. Peter says it this way. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak evil against you as when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. So thinking of that, our main thought for this morning is that a life of true worship declares to the world that our God alone is worthy of worship. When we devote our lives to worship the one true God, our testimony declares to the world that he alone is worthy. We must guard our hearts against idolatry, showing that there is no other God worth following. Our lives should reflect this truth, that there is only one God. He has given us his word, the Bible, and we are called to serve him with our full devotion. And as we live on this earth and worship him, God promises never to leave us or forsake us. He gives us his spirit and walks with us every step of the way. We serve a God who is near to us, yet so high, yet he's so high above us, yet, yet, yet he, he is close to us. And he deserves, but he, he's, so off, he's so lofty that he deserves everything that we have. He promises deliverance. He promises restoration. In him we have hope that whatever, whether it's life or death, our faith in him will not be misplaced. When we worship the Lord despite the pressure to conform to the culture, we are declaring that he is worthy. When we worship the Lord in the face of persecution, we are declaring that he is worthy. 
When we worship the Lord through the pain and suffering and trials in this world, we demonstrate that he is worthy. When we give God glory and praise through the good times and the bad, we are boldly declaring that he is worthy. We cannot bow down to the gods of this world. We cannot compromise with the world's way. We must be his people in this time that are lights in the world, declaring that our God is worthy by choosing to serve and worship him alone. But let's be clear about this. The kind of devotion and commitment does not come just from our own strength that we muster up within ourselves. It wasn't because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had some extraordinary courage that none of us can have. No, what set them apart was their faith. They believed in the promises of God. They heard how God delivered their fathers out of Egypt. They heard how God had delivered their people in the battles. They believed that a Messiah was coming. They hoped in the promises of God. They believed that what he had done and what he was going to do, and that's what gave them the courage to be able to stand. And for us today, we hope in the gospel. We can look back at what Christ has already done for us because Jesus has already been through the fire. He came to earth. He died for us and suffered the penalty of death that we deserve. But Jesus walked through the flames of hell, victorious over sin and death. And it's because of that victory, it's because of the salvation that he has secured for us that we can stand boldly in worship of him alone. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our sacrifice. He is worthy of all of our lives because he has given everything for us. See, it's our faith in the gospel that comes by God's grace that should, that, that should drive us to an unwavering and unshakable commitment to worship him alone. So church, we've seen through this passage that a life of true worship declares to the world that our God alone is worthy. So as we draw to the end, here, here are a couple of thoughts that I wanna challenge us on, things that I want us to reflect on as we think about this message through the week. First of all, ex examine your life for idolatry. Take an honest inventory of your life. What are you bowing down to? Where's your time, energy, and devotion going? Is it your career, your comfort, your entertainment, your relationships, your status? These can all become idols that subtly take the place of God in our lives. So I challenge you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal in you any area where you set up an idol against God and make the decision to tear it down. Think, next thing I want us to think about is to, to take your worship beyond Sunday. Worship isn't confined to the songs that we sing during the worship time. It's about our daily life choices. So when you wake up tomorrow, will you live like God is worthy of all your devotion? Will you obey him when it's inconvenient? Will you choose his way when his way conflicts with your desires? I challenge you this week to constantly choose worship in every decision that you make. Let your life be an, an ongoing offering to God every single day. Third thing I want us to consider is that we need to worship even when it's costly. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to face a fiery furnace rather than compromise their worship to God. Are we willing to stand firm when it means losing popularity or comfort or security? Again, I want to challenge you this week, take the stand, whether it's in a, a, a conversation at work, maybe it's a decision in your family, or maybe it's just an internal battle that you are having with sin. Stand firm and declare with your life that God alone is worthy of your worship. And then finally, worship the Lord missionally. Remember, your worship is a part of God's mission. When you live with uncompromising devotion, the world takes notice. So I want to challenge you to be bold in your witness this week. Look for opportunities to share why you live the way that you do. Why do you serve the Lord with your whole heart? Why do you have this confident hope in Jesus Christ? The world is full of people bowing down to idols and they're searching for meaning and hope. So we need to be the light that points them to the one true God. So those th four things we need to take on this week. Take your, uh, um, first, we need to examine your, your life for idolatry. Take your worship beyond Sunday. 
Worship even when it's costly. And then worship the Lord missionally. Then if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, we've seen today that our God alone is worthy of worship. And the greatest act of God's love and power was through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose from the dead to offer salvation. In his grace, God has allowed you to hear the good news of the gospel today. And I encourage you to respond by making this decision to follow Jesus Christ. This invitation is, is to a life of true worship, of, of peace and purpose. And so if that's you, if God's stirring your heart and you don't know Christ, we'd love to ta- talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. But for those of us that are saved, may our faith in God's, uh, in God's gospel drive us to worship. May our lives reflect that he alone is worthy. May the words of this hymn ring true in us, worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise, worthy of reverence, worthy of fear, Worthy of love and devotion. Worthy of bowing and bending of knees. Worthy of all this and added to these. You are worthy, Father Creator. You are worthy, Savior Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. We're gonna take some time now to to reflect on the sermon. So uh, you can pray there at your seats. Um, And then uh, after that, we'll have our time of communion. Um, When the worship team begins to sing, you can go to the left or right, grab the elements of communion. Um, We invite everyone that is baptized a believer to partake in communion with us this morning. And then uh, after our song is finished, Pastor Jeremy will come up and he will lead us in communion together. So take some time now, bow your heads and talk to the Lord about whatever he has laid on your heart.